Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, our last talk for our afternoon session from 2.50 to 3.50, which will be given by our Vladimir Chalov, who is the Robert and Anne Burnett Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue University. Vladimir has been pioneered uh, in many fields in optics from, for example, nanophotonics and optical metamaterials. Today, Vladimir will be talking about empowering quantum photonics with nanoplasmonics and machine learning. Everyone, please welcome Vladimir. Sorry, you are mute. You are muted. So I was uh, muted in the part when I thank you actually for presenting me. Thanks again and thank you for having me. It's uh, a pleasure to share some of our uh, results and ideas uh, in this area. Uh, in the ongoing quantum uh, technology revolution, many if not most believe that uh, photonics and specifically quantum photonics will be playing a very important role. And in this lecture, what I would like to emphasize how the ideas from uh, a different field related to metamaterials and metasurfaces and from yet another technology evolution related to AI uh, could be employed to, uh, for quantum devices in general and uh, for quantum photonics specifically. So, uh, and so here's the outline of my lecture. I'll start with introduction to nanophotonics and plasmonics. Uh, then I say a few words about the excitement and the great expectations related to this uh, technology evolution in quantum. And uh, I'll uh, then make uh, my main message uh, why plasmonics actually could make a difference for quantum photonics, emphasizing that, that it could enable actually speeds, uh, exceptionally high speeds, potentially outpacing uh, decoherence rate that uh, could make quantum photonics devices really fast, which uh, in my opinion, that's absolutely critical for high performance devices. So I will say a few words about how important actually deterministically assemble this uh, plasmonic devices that speed up quantum processes. And through my talk, I will be repeating the importance of uh, machine learning for quantum photonics, uh, particularly for quantum photonics, because you have to deal with small signals and it's very critical to have this uh, assistance from AI. And I will demonstrate it for one uh, potentially really important case uh, uh, related to quantum super resolution imaging. Of course, uh, for any uh, new technology, it's really critical to have it uh, uh, integrated uh, system. So in this case, integrated quantum devices. And uh, toward the end, I will say a few words about hybrid sensors which we are lately using uh, that employ magnet coupling. And I will end up with Outlook. It's undeniable that there is a great societal need to process information faster. In this plot, what you can see, it's calculations per second, per hundred dollars, uh, how, uh, how different technologies, different systems would evolve this time in this regard. And we start like with, uh, analytical simple engine and going to nowadays uh, non-electronics based uh, computers. And uh, again, most believe that next speed up in terms of uh, how fast we could process information would be enabled by, uh, by optics, photonics and quantum. And that explains the uh, these great interest over these fields. So when you try to contrast uh, electronics, uh, which indeed change our life. I mean, it's uh, the impact of electronics truly tremendous uh, against photonics. So the key advantage, potential advantage of photonics is the speed. Uh, because of uh, some energy constraints and uh, fundamental RC delays, electronics actually cannot uh, process information faster, can it be faster than 10 at most, perhaps 100 gigahertz. Whereas with photonics, you are limited only by the Killian frequency, which is 10 to the 15. So, and that explains why people are so much uh, excited about photonics and try to uh, uh, employ it every time when it's possible. And in that regard, it's indeed not surprising that uh, computers 
uh, start uh, starting to use more and more optical elements, and uh, such as uh, integrated photodetector, uh, modulators, uh, wavelengths division, the multiplexers integrated with CMOS uh, uh, circuitry, and of course uh, lots of optical waveguides. That's uh, the tendency to uh, place as many as possible optical elements to eventually process information faster. However, with this technology, when you bring optical elements into your computer, you still diffraction limited, which means that the size of optical elements are roughly 100 nanometers or several hundred nanometers. So they are still far, uh, by far uh, larger than the size of electronic elements. And it seems that the only feasible way to shrink size of optical elements to the size comparable to what we have in electronics is to use plasmonics and specifically localized surface plasmons. And I'm giving here a couple examples. Here you have small metallic sphere where electrons bounce up and down. And uh, that's a, the, an example of localized surface plasmons. And perhaps even more potentially important example of this type of surface plasmon excitation, so-called gap plasmons, when uh, electromagnetic uh, excitations is actually confined to the electric gap between two metallic structures. And the gap could be really small, few nanometers only, and uh, the whole uh, electromagnetic mode could be confined to this dielectric gap. So that's the idea to take the speed of optics and use plasmonics to shrink as much as possible the volume of electromagnetic mode. And before we proceed to engineered structures, let me say a few words about uh, localized surface plasmons in uh, so-called fractal structures. They're beautiful. And the physics is truly fascinated, fascinating. And uh, in fractals, as we showed in our fractals, actually uh, scale invariant structures, either deterministically, like in this case of uh, Thorn, when uh, you basically the structure of the whole is reproduced in progressively smaller scales. So you could see that uh, you go in smaller and smaller scales, you basically have the same structure. Or uh, the structure of the whole is reproduced on progressively smaller scale statistically on average, like in the case of this uh, fractal aggregate of uh, silver colloidal particles. And as we showed in our early uh, work, uh, the fractal morphology actually promotes localization. It turns out mathematically this problem could be mapped to the famous Anderson localization problem. In this case, collective plasma excitations uh, tend to be localized in very small nanometer scale areas uh, result in a very high local field intensity, significantly uh, 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 exceeding the field intensity of incident uh, light. So we refer to these uh, areas as hotspots, and because of these hotspots, optical responses in fractals are dramatically enhanced, particularly nonlinear optical responses. So in general, I should say that these random composites with localized uh, excitations, optical excitations, we in many regards precursors to uh, optical metamaterials, uh, and there is lots of interest uh, lately toward metamaterials and metasurfaces, uh, largely because of their uh, truly fantastic uh, applications and new applications, and perhaps one of the most exciting one is related to ultra-thin, uh, nearly flat optics based on uh, uh, metasurfaces, and uh, really good examples of this type of devices include uh, metal lens, uh, flat ultra-thin metal lens, uh, metal hologram, and non-reciprocal uh, uh, device which based on uh, time varying metasurface shown here. All right, so and above I was talking about localized surface plasma excitations, where basically uh, it's confined in all three directions and the size of the area is much smaller than the wavelengths. Uh, if your plasma excitation actually propagates, for example, along a metal dielectric interface, or like in this uh, example shown in the picture, uh, plasma gap slot waveguide. So in this case, we call of, uh, about surface plasma polaritons. So it's emphasizing the wave aspect of this. And the beauty and the unusual aspect about the surface plasma polariton, that they of course have optical uh, frequency, but they have uh, wavelengths which could be uh, like a few tens of nanometers. So basically they have X-ray wavelengths. And that's why uh, this uh, surface plasma polaritons are also very promising uh, for plasmonic nanocircuitry. And uh, people have been thinking uh, how actually to bring as many as possible plasmonic elements in 
uh, silica nanophotonic circuitry because we people would like to have smaller and smaller sizes to place more and more elements on the chip. And here you could uh, see the vision for this type of approach for hybrid plasmonic slash silica nanophotonic circuitry. So where you have uh, some uh, uh, nanophotonic elements such as uh, waveguide in photonic crystals or uh, micro cavity in photonic crystal, which is enhanced by bringing plasmonic elements into the game, which provide further confinement of electromagnetic excitations to areas much smaller than the wavelengths in free space. And specifically, you could see that these plasmonic elements could be used for plasmonic coupler, which allows to couple uh, uh, light coming from optical fiber onto a chip, uh, plasmonic, uh, uh, nanoplasmonic delay line, as it's shown here, and plasmonic photo detector when you place inside of a micro cavity, like plasmonic bow uh, nano antenna, which provides a shrinking of electromagnetic excitation down to a few nanometers only, as well as plasmonic splitter. Uh, splitter. So this is one of the way to combine silicon nanophotonic and plasmonics to uh, go to smaller sizes. So let's uh, move toward quantum. And uh, of course, we have really great expectations related to quantum. And uh, because with quantum, we can enable ultimate control of matter and we expect, and actually it's already going on, that quantum uh, could bring us to truly transformative technologies. And therefore there is no surprise that actually a number of recent Nobel prizes uh, awarded in areas uh, closely related to quantum. And it's also uh, uh, quite understandable why this quantum is listed among top uh, transformative technologies. So that explains the whole excitement related to this area. So when uh, we come to the question, what actually, what kind of material platform would win the quantum, would win the uh, quantum race? Which would be, which would, which one would have the winning performance? So there is clearly a trade-off uh, between inter interaction strength, uh, where superconducting uh, materials actually uh, seem to provide better control, and coherence time with affordance. Uh, provide better uh, protection. And of course, in between, we have all other uh, quite successful approaches and, uh, 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 and platforms which people are using now uh, based on color centers in uh, solids, based on trapped ions and arrays of Rydberg atoms. In the end of the day, uh, I personally think that so people are gonna use some kind of hybrid platform because they all have their own pros and cons. But one thing is, uh, pretty much uh, everybody probably would agree that photonics will play a central role in uh, uh, future quantum technologies. And in the end of the day, with photons, we package information into a signal of zero mass and propagate it the ultimate speed, which is speed of light. And uh, therefore, uh, it's clear that quantum photonics will be very essential for quantum communication quantum networking, quantum sensing, uh, uh, quantum simulations, and probably for quantum computing. And all these uh, exciting applications related to the one simple fact that photons are very robust. They don't couple to each other, they don't have charges, and they couple to matter uh, very weakly, therefore they are robust. But this is a, a two-ended, double-ended uh, double sword, double-edged sword, because uh, to produce photons and to manipulate them, we do need actually to control to control light matter coupling. And the reason that typically light matter coupling, uh, physically it's simple because the size of the wavelengths is much larger than the size of quantum union such as atom. But because of that, uh, quantum photonic applications, such for example as um, this satellite-based uh, quantum communication occur at really low rates, like in this case, 10 kilobit per second, which of, which of course is way too low for photonics. We expect for photonics uh, potentially much higher speeds. And that was the point in, in my introduction. So for that, we need really to control light meta coupling. So, and that exactly where plasmonics could come into the game and actually comes into the game because it could uh, provide this dramatic speed up. And in this part, I, uh, he, I, when I will speak of plasmonic application, I would mention several applications uh, where plasmonics could make a difference. One, is, uh, one of them is related to ultra-fast modulators, 
uh, which are used for uh, optical nanocircuitry. Another one is a uh, uh, single photon emitter, where it will show that plasmonics could speed up the rate with which uh, four single photons produce dramatically. I also speak of uh, importance how to, how to uh, make deterministically these plasmonic antennas. I'll show that plasmonics could be used for single shot optical spin readout, which is important to control uh, spin qubits. And through all this discussion, I will show uh, how much difference actually machine learning could, uh, could make. Let's start with these ultra-fast plasmonic modulators. So this is a hybrid system. Basically, uh, you uh, send your information through uh, uh, optical fiber, sorry, uh, through silicon waveguide. And because losses are small, so uh, it propagates uh, uh, without uh, much uh, losses. And it's coupled to uh, plasmonic uh, gold splint, uh, split ring resonator, where in the ring you place uh, uh, electro-optical organic material, which changes its refractive index when you apply voltage. And if refractive index such that uh, light doesn't couple to this uh, uh, plasmonic ring cavity, then it does go through. So uh, this is your own regime. If you apply voltage, change the refractive index, and there is coupling to this plasmonic ring resonator, then uh, light actually it couples to the cavity, and this is your off regime. And it turns out this is really a remarkable device. It could show modulations as strong as 10 dB with the extinction rate ratio 10 dB. And most importantly, it's high speed. High speed, it's, uh, uh, it operates at terahertz rate, and it's uh, relatively compact, smaller than, uh, let's say, than photonic devices. So this is an example how plasmonic could actually speed up uh, optical processes and bring them to a relatively small scale. But coming back to this generic problem of controlling light matter coupling. So we know how actually to increase light matter coupling. So we simply place our quantum system, atom, let's say two level atom, spin, whatever, uh, inside of a cavity. And inside of cavity, of course, photons go many times through your uh, quantum system and that effectively increases the coupling. And the enhancement of coupling goes uh, proportional to the Purcell factor, which is uh, the ratio of quality factor of your cavity and the volume where electromagnetic mode is uh, confined. And then most of people uh, use the approach with dielectric cavities where quality factor is really huge, a million, sometimes hundred millions, but the volume still is limited by diffraction limit. So the volume cannot be smaller than, uh, let's say, lambda cube, where lambda is the wavelength. And importantly, even though you do have enhancement in light matter coupling, uh, such system is um, essentially slow, simply because the higher the quality factor, the slower the response, as we well know. So what if you will employ a kind of alternative approach? And instead of having high Q, let's say, let's use plasmonic nanostructure where Q is relatively low, like 100 or so, but volume is exceptionally small, much smaller than the wavelength. So in this case, you could have a plasmonic mode uh, confined down to uh, an area with the size five nanometers or even less. So in this case, in terms of the enhancement of light matter coupling, you get as big advantage as in the case of dielectric cavities. But because Q is relatively low, your system would be broadband and operate really fast at terahertz rate. So plasmonics through exceptionally small volumes enables light matter coupling, increasing light matter coupling without sacrificing the speed. And that's, I think, essential because that could enable uh, the speed which outpaces uh, decoherence rate. We know, and that could be actually complementary to uh, approach which many groups pursue now to increase coherence time in your quantum system as much as possible by trapping atoms or ions by going to extremely low pressures and extremely low temperatures. That of course good and it works and you increase the coherence time. But what if uh, on top of that, we'll try to do something else. We try to speed up the, uh, uh, the rate with which quantum process occurs, such as for example, a single photon emission, so that it would, the photon would be emitted before decoherence happens. So the idea here is you see kind of different, you speed up the rate of quantum processes so that they outpace the decoherence rate. And since the process happens before decoherence starts, it becomes immune to decoherence. So you have similar enhancement in terms of light matter coupling, but your process becomes much faster. 
and therefore could outpace the decoherence. So that's that's the idea, and that's where plasmonics actually could uh, find this unique way to advance quantum devices to higher operational speeds. So, and uh, one specific example is related to producing a uh, single photon, uh, single photons, which is a very important, which is in the heart of many, many applications to have reliable sources for single photons. For that, we will place a quantum emitter such as a nano diamond with nitrogen vacancy, single nitrogen vacancy, uh, inside of this uh, nano page plasmonic container, which is formed by silver cube, like it's shown here, single crystal silver cube, uh, sitting on top of a pitaxial silver film. And in between, you have this nano diamond. The role of antenna in this case, twofold. Because of the uh, gap plasmon enhancement, uh, if gap is small, so you have this strong gap plasmon enhancement. This is pure cell enhancement. But antenna itself, the size of the tube, should be relatively large so that it would outcouple photons at very high rates, faster than decoherence rate and faster than uh, rate with which uh, plasmons decay. So if you accomplish that, you would have loss-free, very efficient source of single photons, which uh, would be uh, potentially immune to decoherence. So that's the idea. Here, uh, I'm showing our first kind of simple-minded experiment done some time ago. So we would simply take nano diamonds, relatively small in size, like 25 nanometers, so that some of them have uh, this single uh, nitrogen vacancy. You just randomly distribute it on a silver glass, uh, sorry, on a silver uh, film. And then that randomly uh, you uh, uh, disperse silver cubes so that just by chance in some cases, silver cube would end up sitting on top of nano diamond. So uh, that's the idea. Of course, it's not really deterministic approach, but still we obtain that uh, typically on average, we would get like 100 times increase in the rate with which uh, single photon are emitted and uh, also the brightness of the source also was uh, increased roughly by 100, meaning that it's all was radiative. Uh, but of course that's, and to, to prove that we are dealing with single photon sources, as always we would measure uh, this G2 correlation function. But this approach of course, far from being optimal. And uh, the next step to further increase the enhancement provided is by plasmonic container is to use deterministic assembly. So in this approach, we first place this nano diamond, these nitrogen vacancies on glass substrate. We characterize them, we find really good sources of single photons, uh, bright and uh, stable. And then you pick up that particular nano diamond with a, a tip of AFM and bring it on top of a epitaxial silver film. Then you place some uh, in a nearby area, a silver cube and push it with a uh, tip of AFM so that it climbs uh, at top of this nano diamond. And it, uh, this, in the end, you have this nano diamond sitting at the edge of your nano cube where the Purcell enhancement is the largest. And you get really strong Purcell enhancement in this case. And the results, uh, not surprisingly, are by far more impressive in this case, specifically what we obtain that uh, lifetime shortening is 3,500 times. So. And also we obtained record fast decay rate for single nitrogen vacancy, which was as short as 23 picosecond. We checked that it's indeed a single photon source by measuring this G2 correlation function. And as our theory uh, shows that in, in, in fact, if you further optimize this system, that, uh, uh, and uh, specifically, this is the numbers we would like to have, like the size of the cavity should be really small, like three nanometers. Uh, for this, of course, we probably would prefer to use not nano diamonds, but rather uh, something like 2D material, like HBN, uh, which does have good single photon sources in uh, the facts. Whereas the size of antenna, uh, let's say 60 nanometers, so that efficiently out couples, we showed that in this case, the radiation efficiency is as high, could be as high as 96%, and photons emitted at the rate 300 terahertz. And that happens because this efficient antenna outcouples photons before plasmons decay. And potentially uh, with this rate, uh, 300 terahertz, actually typical decoherence time is one picosecond, or let's say a few terahertz. So with this rate, basically photons would be emitted before decoherence happens. And that would potentially 
uh, let us to have this room temperature source of indistinguishable single photons. And of course, this type of source is in the heart of many, many quantum applications, including quantum uh, computing. So that's uh, an example of how we actually plasmonics through uh, confining light to really tiny nanometer scale areas could speed up plasmonic processes. I mentioned that machine learning plays a role uh, could play a really important role in this uh, in this type of activities and let me illustrate it so if you look at the uh, let's say nano diamond dispersion uh, glass substrate that's actually how photoluminescence map looks like a lot of nano diamond bright some of them are good some are not good and to correct to find the right uh, nano diamond which has good characteristics and uh, let's say stable has a high quantum property uh, quantum purity it takes a long time so it's it's really time consuming process and imagine you would like to build on a photonic circuit with thousand uh, single photon sources so it simply becomes uh, uh, impossible so and the way we characterize single photon sources is of course well known you use this henry brown trees uh, uh, scheme so uh, which basically is a correlation card with two arms and you measure g2 correlation function function as a, a function of a delay between uh, light coming through two different arms of the correlation curve. So normally it takes several minutes up to one hour to obtain this nice correlation function with a deep at time delay zero. So then you use this Levenberg Markart sheeting, uh, which is given by this uh, uh, standard formula, and you consider this at uh, uh, delay uh, zero delay. And if a G2 is uh, uh, smaller than 0.5, ideally the smaller the better, but if it's smaller than 0.5, you say this is a single photon emitter. If it's above 0.5, it's not a single photon emitter. So, and that's only for one nano diamond, but you have to actually first to find this, it's getting really, really time consuming. And if you do this measurement only within one second, so you obtain very sparse data like it's shown here. And in this case, basically there is no way to say whether it's a single photon source or not. So what machine learning actually could do this, how it could help. So, but again, let to emphasize the problem, to get this nice correlation function, it takes uh, several minutes up to one hour collection time. And let's say if you would like to have really small emitter, and it is important actually to have small emitter because if you take advantage of enhancement provided by gap plasmon, the smaller the gap, the stronger enhancement. And of course, the size of the gap in the end of the day is dictated by the size of your nano diamond. Let's say if you would like to deal with 25 nanom nanometer nano diamonds, only one out of thousand actually has a single in the center. So it becomes really, really time consuming. So could we still do the job uh, with very short collection time, like one second, uh, when you obtain really sparse data set? And that's exactly where machine learning comes into the game because it could assist rapid emitter classification. So what we actually do, we uh, train a neural network uh, uh, based classifier by using one second time collected sparse data. And then we compare it against uh, uh, results obtained with ground truth labels. Basically, you first pre-characterize diamond on a diamonds, you know which are good, which are bad, and then you train your neural network uh, system by collecting this uh, one second time uh, sparse data. And after you did that, after you train uh, your neural network system, then you could do rapid single photon uh, emitter identification among uh, random uh, nitrogen vacancy uh, quantum emitters. So, and here what we obtained, so we took uh, 41 nano diamond. So we pre-characterized them by standard method. Of course, it took a long time to pre-characterize them. It turns out that 15 emitters were single photon emitters and the 26 are not single photon emitters. And the total data set size was around 10,000 because we have uh, many time bins. We use this time delay. And so we have many time bins. So the total data set is like 10,000. And here are the results. So if with one second collection time, if you use direct fitting, when we have to deal with really sparse data, then the accuracy of prediction is around 50%. Basically, it's random guess. Of course, you need to decide whether it's single photon source or not. There are only two options, yes or no. And uh, if your accuracy is 50%, it means it doesn't work. It's just random guess. If you use, uh, in contrast, this uh, train neural network, then you could predict with collection time only one second that your uh, emitter is a single photon or not single photon with pretty high accuracy, 92% and above. 
So here you could see more specs on how this system works. But overall, we could say that we do have indeed nearly two orders of magnitude speed up in uh, the rate with which you identif identify the quality of the quantum emitters in comparison with conventionally used uh, fitting approach. Okay, so uh, let's move toward uh, a quantum super resolution. And again, I will show how this uh, machine learning could actually be very important and helpful. So a uh, few words about super resolution. Okay, so we know that there is this diffraction limit. Basically, uh, with conventional optics, you cannot get resolution better than lambda divided by two in A. Uh, but this limit is based on several fundamental assumption, assumptions, which are listed here. First, linear optics, stationary sample, then homogeneous illumination, and classical fields. If you break either of these assumptions, that enables one of uh, several existing uh, super resolution methods. To be specific, uh, the famous stimulated emission depletion step uh, use nonlinearity and therefore breaks the diffraction limit enabling super resolution. Stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy storm use non stationary sample. And uh, structured illumination microscopy sim uses inhomogeneous uh, source. So the, the question is, uh, if we play classical field with quantum field, could we also get some advantage and go to the super resolution regime? And to the statement here, uh, that which is actually known, that if you do a measurement of the uh, alter correlation function of the case order, not necessarily second order, but possibly higher order, then you could obtain uh, the uh, increase in resolution uh, by factor square root of k. So the higher the order of correlation function, the, the higher the, the, the better improvement in resolution. To understand the idea of this, let's uh, follow this uh, simple Gedanken experiment but that were proposed by Stefan Hell some time ago. Let's assume that we have a source of photons which emits always two photons. Every time it emits, it emits two photons. And let's say that we have this beam splitter, 50-50% beam splitter, so, and two cameras. So clearly in this case, we, do, we would obtain two independent Gaussian spots with the same uh, point spread function. And by simply multiplying these uh, point spread functions, uh, we would obtain square root of two uh, gain in resolution. Of course, this is classical experiment. If you do quantum experiment now, in this case, uh, the, in the quantum experiment, the emitter is anti batched which means that in this case, we measure the absence of two photon correlations. But the point here, we are still dealing with the same amount of information due to some uh, sub Poissonian statistics of photon emission. So that you could get this square root of k uh, increase in the uh, resolution. So here you could see first experiments, at the, that's the reference at the bottom. So the, the way people do this, they just do, they just correlate this G2 map, the correlation function of second order in this case at zero delay with photoluminescence map. And by doing so, you could reconstruct image, which is uh, improved in resolution by square root of two. So if you do it third order, it would be uh, square root of three and so on. So, uh, there are some uh, pros and cons with this approach. Of course, pros, uh, basically you could use this technique in combination with other super resolution techniques, but cons, it takes extremely long characterization time, particularly if you use the high order outer correlation function. So, and that clearly gives you a hint where machine learning could make a difference because uh, it could speed up uh, the uh, measurement of this uh, outer correlation function map. And here you could see the results of this approach. Basically, you could see here this pre-trained convolutional neural network, which determines this map G2 at the zero delay in each pixel of image. This is the map of G2. And next, you simply correlate it with photoluminescence map and retrieve image with improved uh, resolution, as we just discussed before. So that's uh, the, the way we do it. And here you could see result. This is photoluminescence map, uh, photoluminescence map. This is the map uh, for G2 alter correlation uh, uh, function, which obtained with the help of convolutional neural network. And by correlating these two images, you obtain this reconstructed image, image with uh, improved resolution. So, and the important thing here is that, here that machine learning assisted super resolution method requires only 1.4 hours. 
uh, if you compare it with direct, direct uh, uh, retrieval, it would use 17 hours. So we have a speed up by factor of 12. So which is uh, quite significant. And if you to prove that we uh, do have the square root of two improvement in special resolution as expected, we just fit with this sports of imaging of a single nano diamond with nitrogen vacancy uh, with this is photoluminescence map. And the, this is sigma you obtain. And this is uh, the retrieved image. And you could see that the width of this image is exactly uh, smaller by square root of two. So you could image a single nano diamond with improved resolution uh, by square root of two and machine learning uh, speeds up this process. So to sum up this uh, machine learning impact uh, again, so let me just say that machine learning assisted autocorrelation function measurement is a classification accuracy of over 92%, Principle could be higher, but at least that's what we obtain in our experiment. Within the integration time of less than one second, so it's 100 times speed up. But importantly also, it allows to retrieve the value of G2 based on few seconds partial autocorrelation measurement. So with conventional way, it would be simply impossible. If for some reason I cannot spend more time, uh, basically without machine learning, it's, you simply cannot do it. And the other thing which I already emphasized that uh, you could employ this uh, uh, machine learning for rapid super resolution imaging via anti-bunching. So in this case, we show that machine learning assisted uh, approach uh, uh, shrinks the time needed by a factor of 12. It's uh, you would do it 12 times faster super resolution imaging via anti-bunching effect uh, if you employ machine learning. All right, so let's move on and uh, as in any technology, uh, it's very important actually to move toward integrated quantum devices. And that's what I want to spend some time on. Our uh, hybrid system where we try to integrate different elements uh, is shown here. That's actually the work we are doing largely uh, within the Quantum Science Center. And uh, here you could see our collaborators. Uh, so what we do in this case, we Play some spin qubit uh, based on, let's say, um, nitrogen vacancy nano diamond, for example, or other quantum spin defect, and which could be initiated and controlled with microwave photons. These qubits coupled to other qubits via magnets, because these qubits are sitting on the field, magnetic field, which supports magnets. And qubits can be read out with optical photons. So that you bring together microwave optical photons for controlling quantum spin defects, which are coupled via magnets. And the whole operation, the conflict between spins and magnets is controlled electrically by placing the whole system on a ferroelectric substrate. So when you apply the voltage, you actually change the coupling for the reason I will discuss in a moment. So, but before, let me just mention that, uh, of course, there we are, many results obtained, remarkable results obtained with uh, nitrogen vaccine, uh, vacancy in diamond. And the reason for that is you could really control this uh, uh, spin resonance with, by simply uh, applying microwave radiation. So you could control the, uh, the state of this, the spin state, and you could read it optically via optically detected magnetic resonance. And people demonstrated that this nitrogen vacancy diamond could be employed for record breaking sensitivity sensors of magnetic field, electrical field, temperature. And of course, the same system works as a perfect interface between optics, photonics, and spin. So that's a, a really exciting system. And before I move to our, back to our hybrid system, let me uh, come back to what we discussed before, how plasmonics actually could speed up quantum processes. I already discussed how it could uh, enable actually production single fold and much higher rates. So how about single shot optical spin readout uh, enabled by plasmonics? So we know that uh, you could excite spins, uh, particular spin projection state by applying microwave radiation. And we also know that brightness for these two different uh, spin projections, zero and plus minus one is different. And that's because of the presence of this non-radiative channel, which brings a uh, uh, system from spin projection plus minus one to spin projection zero. And I, 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 if you have, let's say, prepared certain spin and you would like to read it optically, you don't want to read it for too long because eventually you will bring everything to spin projection zero. So you would like it to read it within uh, one uh, single shot, which would be 
uh, comparable or shorter than this uh, relaxation rate between two uh, spin subsystems, which is roughly 300 nanoseconds. But the problem within this short period of time, fewer than one photon is emitted. So you really cannot detect it. So you have to make like thousands of cycles prepare over and over again the system in the same way to read the, uh, the qubit state. So alternatively, what you could do, you could use plasmonics, which speed up uh, the emission of these single photons uh, by huge factors. So bringing the number of counts to, let's say, to hundreds of uh, million counts per second. And when you have that speed up, then actually you could read the spin state within one single shot. So this is yet another example how plasmonics could be employed to read uh, uh, qubit states uh, within one single shot. But let's come back to our hybrid system. So the way it looks, as I described, you have this magnetic film, in our case, COFIB, which supports uh, uh, magnets. And this uh, 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 magnetic film is sitting on top of ferroelectric substrate. What happens in this case, when you apply voltage and induce polarization in substrate, it introduces stress in your magnetic film. And because of this stress, it changes the magnitude and direction of magnetic anisotropy. And when you change the magnetic anisotropy, so you actually change the structure, the, uh, the band structure of magnets in, in these magn magnetic films. So, uh, and when that happens, you actually could uh, bring your system in two different situations. Let's say if magnetic band is above the, uh, the frequency of your spin resonance, and spin resonance is associated with this uh, nitrogen vacancy nanodiamond sitting in the top of this magnetic film. If there is no overlap between the frequency of uh, spin resonance and magnetic bands, there is no coupling. And then if you measure uh, relaxation, spin relaxation by using optics, this is standard optical spin relaxation technique, you measure it with optical photons, because there is no coupling between local spin uh, and the magnet bands, the rate of relaxation is relatively low. If, however, you apply voltage, introduce stress, change the magnetization, and move the magnetic band so that the magnet bands now overlaps with the frequency of local spin resonance, then the rate of relaxation of spin increases because of the coupling, coupling between magnets and spin. And again, you detect it with optical photons. So the spin relaxation rate detected optically is a measure of coupling between nitrogen vacancy spins and magnets. And that coupling could be controlled by simply applying voltage to the substrate, which through uh, stress uh, changes the band structure of uh, magnets. So that's the idea. And here you could see more results on this. First, we did this uh, sanity uh, check. So basically we uh, measured this uh, relaxation rate as a function of applied magnetic fields. Of course, when you apply magnetic field, you change this Zeeman splitting between projection plus and minus one, and it's relatively magnetic, uh, small magnetic field, external fields. When uh, the spin resonance overlaps with magnet band, you have high rate of spin relaxation because of the coupling between magnets and spin. So when you increase the magnetic field, so you move the uh, spin resonance outside of the magnet bands and the rate decreases. So in the same could be done by applying electrical field instead of magnetic field, which through the stress actually uh, changes the magnitude and the direction of magnetization. And you could see here that low voltage, there is no overlap between spin, spin resonance of nitrogen vacancy and magnet band. So the coupling is small and the relaxation rate is small. When you increase the voltage, the relaxation rate increases. So that's, that's the idea how you could control coupling between magnets and spins and measure it through optical spin relaxometry. So before we move on, uh, since we are speaking about integrating uh, a system, integrating quantum devices, it's indeed very important to have scalable material platform. And one of such platforms is of course, silicon nitride. It's hard to overestimate the importance of silicon nitride materials platform for nanophotonics. And uh, what we recently accomplished, this is a very recent result, actually, by slightly preparing in silicon nitride wafer, and specifically we use high density plasma CVD, and we would uh, obtain non-stichometric uh, uh, silicon nitride with higher ratio of nitrogen. 
and that was followed by rapid thermal annealing. And it turns out if you follow this uh, procedure, that you dramatically suppress the fluorescence background. And uh, that system uh, would start to uh, show a very efficient singular photon emitters uh, associated with some defects in the silicon nitride. So what we obtained that this single photon emittance are bright, uh, above uh, 100,000 counts per second, they're stable, linearly polarized, and they have pretty high uh, purity of single photon emission without even background correction to or spectral filtering. So we would routinely obtain G2 at the level of below 0.2. In some cases, it's below 0.1. So that's actually uh, shows that uh, the very standard scalable uh, silicon nitride platform could be used for quantum photonics, which uh, might be very important news. Uh, and of course, when it comes down to developing this quantum photonic circuitry, as I pointed out, machine learning uh, comes at hand. You have to deal with very small signals. And when you uh, need to characterize and measure uh, these small signals, it's particularly important to optimize your system. And machine learning assisted topology optimization could be used for uh, building uh, this efficient coupling between antenna and, uh, and waveguarding system. So it could be employed, and that's what we are doing right now, to optimize uh, cavities, couplers, guiding systems, waveguarding systems, and nonlinear frequency converters. For all these key elements of quantum photonic circuitry, machine learning makes a big difference. And uh, I would claim that it would be probably impossible to do this without machine learning in that regard the importance of machine learning for quantum photonics is much stronger than for classical nanophotonics because you have to deal with very, very small signals. And the uh, machine learning approach we use for this type of topology optimization, it's a so-called variational autoencoder. So uh, variational autoencoder is a system of coupled two convolution neural networks, encoder and decoder. What the encoder does, it compresses features of training set to compact uh, Latin space shortened here, and decoder just learns to read it out and reconstruct. So yet another thing which is uh, very recent, but kind of interesting and exciting, we actually showed that a uh, quantum D-wave machine could be used uh, quite efficiently for solving uh, continuous uh, optimization problems in nanophotonics. Well, it's well known that there are many optimization combinatorial problems which are mathematically reduced to this quadratic unconstrained binary optimization, CUBA. An example of this include like optimization of traffic flow, uh, 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 graph coloring, uh, number partition, and many others. On the other hand, of course, it's uh, well known that this CUBA, uh, uh, the, this CUBA problem uh, could be mapped to Ising uh, model Hamiltonian uh, shown here. And this is exactly what D-Wave is actually uh, uh, designed for. It does this global optimization via quantum evolution to the ground state. So what we did uh, recently, we basically uh, employed binary variational autoencoder assisted CUBA framework uh, in order to encode continuous optimization problems, such as some of nanophotonic problems I mentioned, into binary compressed space and samples and, uh, and uh, space and sample it with quantum assisted CUBA samples. And uh, we use a couple showcases uh, how this system works. Specifically, we uh, uh, used optimization of uh, uh, thermal emitters, free form thermal emitters for thermal photovoltaics, and also optimization of diffraction uh, grating for uh, beam steering. So that uh, looks very interesting. We keep working on this, it's very preliminary results, but uh, well, uh, uh, it, it looks like this uh, D-Wave quantum machine works really well for uh, optimization of nanophotonic problems, continuous problems. So, and as I promised uh, in the end, I'd like to briefly mention this hybrid sensing using magnets. So uh, in this case, why we find this uh, magnets uh, is uh, important, is use and useful, it's because magnets, uh, they uh, provide reduced ohmic losses, as we know. Magnets can enhance uh, microwave fields at nanoscale. Max, uh, magnets is a wonderful universal transducers. They could transduce from uh, microwave to optical, as we know. They couple strongly with quantum defects, as we just actually discussed, and that coupling actually could be controlled electrically. And importantly, natural excitation of 
many uh, candidate materials for future quantum applications uh, could be probed with this uh, hybrid sensors involving magnets. And that includes specifically magnetic topological insulators, Van der Waals magnet, high TC superconductance, spin liquids, etc. So again, this is a big activity within our quantum science center. So let me just illustrate one particular sensing of this hybrid device and specifically for sensing electrical field. We already discussed that when you apply voltage to ferroelectric substrate, you change uh, coupling of a uh, magnet uh, to uh, uh, local spin and uh, that change in coupling could be detected optically with a, via optical spin relaxometry. But of course it works in that way, other way, uh, in another direction too. So if I, by doing this optical spin relaxometry, I could see what is the electrical field actually uh, uh, cost this. So it could be used as a electrical field sensor. However, if you deal with these broadband magnets, so basically you have to move the whole magnets when you apply voltage, the sensitivity not high as possible. And what recently was proposed, uh, this is uh, not done yet experimentally, the uh, experiments are in progress, is to use instead of this broadband uh, magnets, uh, discrete magnet modes, as you could obtain when you have this nanomagnets pattern, you pattern your magnetic film and you create this uh, nanomagnetic structures and you have this discrete magnet modes, which cause sharper change in the relaxation rate when you apply the electrical field. And surprisingly, actually, we uh, the, the, the calculations show that we expect in this case sensitivity nearly three times higher than state-of-the-art uh, um, electrical field sensitivity with nitrogen uh, vacancy. So it's it's a very promise, uh, promising uh, approach to measure electrical field in this case. All right, it's time to move to Outlook because I'd like, I hope to get some uh, questions in that. So I, I would say two major messages in this lecture uh, are as follows. Uh, it's very important to control, to enhance light matter coupling. And if you use plasmonics, which confines electromagnetic modes to exceptionally small sizes, without sacrificing the speed, you could have this dramatic enhancement in light matter coupling uh, and your system would operate at very high speeds, potentially outpacing the speed of decoherence and any losses in the system, or let's say loss of a quantum coherence. And we illustrated this idea specifically for single photon sources when the production of single photons uh, could be uh, made, much, uh, high, made at much higher rates, potentially making them indistinguishable even at room temperatures. But of course, the same idea of speeding up quantum processes could be uh, employed toward other uh, essential ingredients of uh, future quantum photonic circuitry, such as single photon detectors, uh, quantum frequency conversion, converter, and uh, single photon nonlinearity, which is uh, important to enable deterministic gates. So overall, uh, I think uh, uh, potentially when we would be able to speed up quantum processes, that's one of the way to make it less prone uh, to quantum decoherence. And that uh, looks uh, very interesting. And yet another important thing that when it comes down to quantum photonic circuitry, because it's very complex systems and uh, which has to deal with very small signals, it seems to be simply impossible to optimize the system without machine learning. And it works at, uh, uh, many different, in many different ways. Uh, this uh, machine learning assisted optimization could be used for quantum measurements, for rapid characterization of quantum emitters, for metrology, uh, as well as for quantum device optimization. All right, so I, I'm pretty much done. So let me show the team. Of, and this is an excellent a team of uh, really bright students and postdoc. Some of them actually graduated. We actually also have some new group members. It's time to update the picture. And uh, I will end uh, this lecture with the list of uh, topics we discussed so that they could remind you uh, uh, what we actually covered. Thanks again for your patience and uh, your time. Thank you so much, Vladimir, for really fascinating talk on using machine learning and plasmonics to nanophotonics from many, many examples such as uh, super resolution, turbocharging, G2 tau measurement, QBO, and so on and so forth. So I see one quick question from the, uh, uh, the audience. So uh, the question is, is the trend neural network uh, in real time directly applied to the uh, 
directly apply to the new spectra ap after the existing uh, or the current data being captured? Uh, or you... it's a, is sorry. it an online or a, uh, how to say, offline or online process? Or... So, so I, I, I am sorry, I, I, I heard your questions. If you could repeat, please. Yeah, no problem. So is the uh, uh, the training and then the application of the model on uh -huh. a real-time process? Uh-huh. Or, or, or not, most, in most of the cases here? Well, actually, you kind of break, I hear only part of your sentence. You said that uh, training of neural network uh, happens what? <laughs> or, or what? It looks like I'm losing you. I could not catch the question. Uh, is the trend neural network working uh -huh. in real time directly after the spectra is collected or it's done after the fact? Well, to, well uh, the, the, the way it works, you pre-characterize your system. Okay, you, you first spend quite a bit of time. So like, so you, like, for example, you know that these photons are single photon emitters, these emitters are single photon, these are not single photon emitters. So, but then uh, you collect this one second spectra, which are very sparse, and you correlate, you compare it against the known data, and that works as a training set. But as, as long as you train it, then you take a known uh, emitter, and then you do it within one second, you say, hey, this is single photo emitter, with accuracy 92% or so. So first it takes time to pre-train, uh, uh, to train your neural networks on, but as soon as it's done, it's one second for new unknown uh, uh, emitter. That's the way it works. Nice. Sorry, so you mean that, uh, for example, if you train your model based on, uh, say, MV, uh, G2Tau autocorrelation function, and then this trend model can be really easily applied to HB and effects or something like that. Okay. Or, okay, so the training is specific for a particular type of emitters. If I train my system for nitrogen vacancy emitters, that would work only for nitrogen vacancy emitters. So if it's a HBN, for example, I have to train my system differently because the model is different. But as right. long as I know what kind of class of emitters I'm working with, I have the model, I did the training and then it works really fast. But of course the uh, training for different systems would be different and you have to do it differently. Cool, thank you so much. Sure. Let me see the audience. So, there seems to be no uh, question popping up. Maybe let me ask one uh, real quick. So how important is the, uh, the structure of the neuron net that you are um, for, for these cases? For example, is it better to have a uh, recurrent neuron network for time dependent data or not, not necessarily? That's, that's, a, that's an interesting question and actually quite deep questions because when we started to use different uh, 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 algorithm, different approaches uh, to train our network and do this optimization classification, we didn't know which one works better. We tried several existing. And it turns out that in one particular case, something works better than other. Uh, and uh, overall, I should say, uh, the machine learning uh, uh, approaches, they are created for other type of problems, like, I don't know, like face recognition, voice recognition, and therefore there is demand for developing uh, uh, physics-based uh, uh, machine learning algorithm, which would be specifically developed for problems at hand, so quantum photonics. And that's actually the direction we are working now in. We are trying to work together with, quantum, with uh, uh, computer scientists and ask and develop algorithm, new machine learning algorithm, which would be specifically optimized for our set of problems, rather than picking up some randomly existing algorithm and see which one is better. And I would say this is very interesting direction. It's not easy. Computer scientists sometimes are reluctant to learn things that we are uh, playing with. And it's for us also is important to make some uh, uh, steps toward them. But I, I think in the end of the day, uh, this is very, very important, developing 
fact, uh, machine learning algorithms specifically designed for particular classes of problems. I see a lot of opportunities here. And within our quantum science set, actually, that what we're also trying to do through collaboration between algorithm people and, uh, and the device people. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see. Okay, actually, one more question from the audience. So uh, the question is, would it be possible to use other plasmonic materials for the plasmonic enhancement as discussed within, with the antennas? Uh, for example, refractory uh, plasmonics. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, you see, it's really, it, um, of course, uh, plasmonics was kind of the field which was almost exclusively developed based on two materials, silver and gold. And uh, that's simply because the uh, uh, decay rate is relatively small there, loss is not as high as in, in other materials, but they have uh, plenty of disadvantages. They cannot sustain high temperature uh, and even elevated temperature. If you have a nanostructure made of gold, even if you increase temperature up to several hundred Celsius, which is way below the bulk melting temperature, you start because of sintering, change the shape, your antenna actually goes off the resonance. So in that regard, the refractory plasmonic materials as I mentioned by person who asked this question, actually very promising because uh, if you use, for example, transition metal nitride like titanium nitride that very much have very similar plasmonic properties and they seem most compatible as opposed to gold. I'm talking about quantum photonic circuitry. And of course, for this, you need to use CMOS compatible materials. I, I, I told how it's important to use silicon nitride. Titanium nitride is CMOS compatible material and that could sustain very high actually temperatures, elevated temperature. It means that your plasmonic structure would deteriorate uh, when you uh, irradiate it with light. But that's not the only plasmonic material. The other very promising class of plasmonic materials is actually transparent conducting oxides. Uh, and the beauty of those materials, they are tunable and uh, switchable, and you could control it for simply through doping, uh, and you could uh, do it optically or electrically. And also they have this wonderful properties, important optical properties, uh, for example, a capsule near zero, uh, the uh, telecommunication wavelength, which again is of special importance. And when epsilon close to zero, you have this dramatic enhancement in nonlinear responses, uh, like what we call near zero index enhanced nonlinear optics. So yes, the answer is using new materials uh, make a huge difference. We certainly should go beyond silver and gold. Uh, in many regards, we would like to use the most compatible materials. We would like them to be switchable, tunable. We would like to control them uh, by uh, external stimuli. So there are plenty of materials to choose from. This is one of the directions activities in our group. And we certainly hope to uh, Basically, well, I was speaking about optimization. Let's say this machine learning optimization should include not only shapes, geometry, sizes, but also a, a large amount of materials which have very different properties, different electric permittivities. And these properties depend on temperature, on wavelengths, and that all should be included into the optimization space. So, and uh, when it comes down to plasmonic materials, uh, indeed, they are not limited to gold and silver only. There are many others to choose from. And depending on what is the problem at hand we're trying to accomplish, other materials might perform much better. Thank you so much. So maybe that's conclude here. So uh, thank you so much again, uh, Vladimir, for the fascinating talk. And uh, luckily, as a, a member of Quantum Science Center, we can hear so much more about your uh, uh, the research you are doing in the near future, too. So yeah, thank you again. And uh, so now, uh, this concludes our afternoon uh, talk session. And uh, we would like to thank, again, uh, thank you, Daniel, Dana, and Vladimir for great talks. And uh, 